in fact, planners are a bit uh, ambiguous. No? On the one end, they uh, promote growth because they think that's necessary in order to bring well-being to the people in the city, in order mm. to pay for green space, for social housing, for hospitals, for trans public transports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in fact, they try to bring this well-being via economic growth. Mm. So the essential, uh, as, uh, uh, let's say, the essential assumption that we need to break is this: that we do need economic, urban economic growth in order to generate well-being. And I think this is a the, the radical mental shift that mm -hmm. degrowth does and that we can bring in also in the planning sphere. We can organize urban space looking directly at well-being of mm -hmm. people, at the way they live, without going through the economic growth. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our societies, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and today we'll talk about the intricate relationship between cities and growth, or economic growth. Indeed, during the last 50 years, um, cities were both the driver of and driven by neoliberal economy. Building malls, tunnels, parkings, flash condominiums, and other expensive landmarks created a new type of urbanism, which embeds financial flows in the built environment. Today, it's hard to imagine a city that does not grow both spatially and financially. The spatial specialization, sorry, the tongue twister of cities is now stripping them from space to satisfy their own needs in terms of uh, nurturing, manufacturing, uh, energy production, and many other uh, vital needs. As such, this episode will try to understand how to break this reinforcing loop between cities and economic growth. To help us explore what would post-growth cities look like, and how to implement them. I have the great pleasure to, to talk with Federico Savini. Federico is an associate professor in environmental planning institutions and politics at the University of Amsterdam, where we are right now. He combines approaches of political sociology, urban planning, and critical geography to study the pathways towards territories and a form of urbanization that thrives within the planetary boundaries. He has and will explore the degrowth perspective on spatial planning, especially in his European Research Council starting grant project, DCycle. And he is also the co editor of the book Post Growth Planning Cities Beyond the Market Economy. And we'll dive a bit deeper on this in a second. With all that being said, Federico, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Arise. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to have this discussion. There are many things that I want to talk with you. Before we get into the specifics of post-growth planning, um, post-growth cities, perhaps it might be interesting to share with, uh, with the listeners uh, and the watchers, how did you start linking these elements? Um, first, growth and planning, and then post-growth and planning. Like, What were some of the elements in your mind that told you, okay, that, that is something interesting, something that I didn't know, and something that I want to spend more time on. Yeah. Thank you, Arise, for the question. Um, yes, I actually, somehow, four years ago, five years ago, I had this epiphany. I realized that uh, planners were not really engaging with the degrowth or post-growth debate. Mm. And when I realized that, I was actually pretty frustrated and surprised because I was like, uh, cities are essential for the economic growth of countries. Uh, that's where actually the economy gets pushed uh, through investments, through human capital, through materials. So I thought it's actually paradoxical that uh, if we talk about the post-growth future, mm. planners are silent uh, voices in this debate. Myself, in fact, I was also surprised of the fact that um, um, as an urban scholar more in general, um, somehow I was overly focusing on degrowth and post-growth solutions to mm. the current um, uh, climate uh, and biodiversity crisis. But uh, what, we, what I missed, in fact, was a bit of framework for planning 
space that would encompass more and more solutions, many of which we would not even know the, of the existence at the moment. In fact, for me, the problem is, was that we were already talking about specific solutions rather than actually institutions and processes that mm. would lead to a different form of urbanization. Mm. Just to give an example, we were all agreeing and discussing about uh, cycling as a form of sustainable mobility or um, uh, including urban agriculture in spaces that uh, would allow it within cities um, or um, you know, uh, collaborative and cooperative forms of housing. These were all solutions available in the degrowth and post-growth literature somehow. But these were, in fact, already examples of uh, uh, what we can call prefigurative forms of post-growth living. What we lacked, what I, fe I felt we were lacking, was a bit of a theory of planning that would mm. allow this and many other solutions to emerge in cities. To give a bit more, you know, the, somehow the processes and the structural conditions that would favor these kind of practices in cities. So that's why I started to think about, okay, what is the <laughs> form of planning that allows these solutions and many more to happen? Um, and then, of course, I engaged in a debate with many colleagues and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we can, of course, explore more many of our, uh, let's say, uh, thought processes uh, that led to uh, more or less an idea of a post-growth planning practice and theory. Yeah, uh, we will get back to this element of um, how uh, post-growth was not uh, available in planning. Uh, I have some, uh, some personal experiences as well from that, and I would like to to see what you have uh, in mind as well. I wanted before that to, to give everyone the same level of understanding. There is, of course, this element, and you mentioned it, that cities are responsible for a majority of throughput of flows, be it uh, financial or material, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is not new, right? And from the 70s, the 80s, this was already known. Um, what is it, the, the Moloch paper, which is city as an... Uh, as an economic engine, or I don't remember exactly. Urban grow machine. Urban grow machine, exactly. Um, David Harvey in the 90s were talking about the spatial fix, right? So it's not new, but can you perhaps uh, paint uh, some of these characteristics? Like why are cities so intricate with uh, financial flows? What is their relationship and why there is this? Why is it this growth machine? Of course, uh, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, in mm -hmm. fact, um, works, uh, especially in the United States and, uh, of course, Western Europe, that were the areas where this type of research was conducted. They, they, they understood that uh, the older uh, industrialized economy was changing into a post-industrial economy. This shift, which Harvey calls, uh, uh, defines as a capitalist uh, switch somehow, was a shift from uh, uh, an, in, in an economy that was governed by countries and nations, in fact, to one where countries and nations were not, on, not anymore the first scales of governance. Cities were becoming more important. Mm. The reason, is, the reason is very simple, is that the product was not any more industrial manufacturing, but it was real estate. Mm. The money came from industrial manufacturing that was at the time in the 80s exp, you know, um, relocated in other countries of the world. Those capitals had to find a new investment sector. And the real estate sector was actually that investment sector. Mm. In fact, in the late 80s, we, call about, we talk about the post-industrial transition of cities, where in fact the redevelopment of industri industrial areas was the actual business, core business <laughs> of urban governments. Yeah. And of course, uh, real estate is still one of the top three uh, commodities of contemporary capitalism. So in fact, it was a, a grow machine because real estate would generate uh, increasing returns on capital investments, and these returns were actually realized, in fact, within dense urban areas. Actually, the most dense areas of cities, where the uh, so-called rent gap would be the uh, the highest, and where in fact returns would be the high returns on investments would be the highest. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, the South Bank of uh, London. Uh, the North of Bank of Amsterdam, mm -hmm. they are very close to city centers, mm -hmm. and that's where, in fact, investments in real estate have huge returns. This economy, 
was an urban economy and mm. it was becoming the driver of the actual national economy. Mm. So cities became what uh, um, others have called the national champions of the economy. At that time, in fact, national governments understood very well that in order to generate economic growth for countries it was necessary to push urban economies to the fastest and uh, to accelerate them. This was the strategy. And to do so, they not only, in fact, liberalized the market of housing and real estate, but also, um, let's say, created all kind of policy framework which would concentrate uh, human and financial capital into cities. Mm. For example, the whole idea of the creative class, mm -hmm. that was also the beginning of the 2000s. The creative class was a, a type of human capital that would generate innovation. And this human capital was particularly urban. I mean, as Richard Florida has described, would in fact uh, appeal to urbanites, people who would uh, like uh, dense urban environments with uh, you know, coffee shops and, uh, and uh, uh, recreation activities. This was an urban form of investment in human capital. So in fact, in those years, we see really a transition from a national to an urban form of capital capitalism. Mm. That's also why in those same years we start talking about planetary urbanization, uh, because this process uh, made it clear that the whole uh, material stock needed for that economy was basically coming from the so-called peripheries of the, 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 the globe to the urban centers. This was a flow to the urban centers, which was uh, unknown and unprecedented relative to the actual uh, industrialized economy of, uh, of uh, the years before to come. Now, this is a story of the uh, Western Europe in particular, of course, Global North. Um, this is where this idea was, uh, mm. first of all, prototyped. Uh, now, of course, this process is questioned and reflected upon based on the new insights we have of urbanization in uh, Global South, in China, in India, in Africa. There, the story is slightly different, but also we see common patterns. But that's why the urban growth machine is still today a very important and effective concept, I think, to, to critique uh, planning. One last note, mm. if it's possible, is that at that time, the ecological question was not central. Mm. So in fact, the urban growth machine was an urban economic growth machine. Mm. It was not uh, what we could define today a uh, urban machine of environmental destruction. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that side came later, let's say, um, and it's something that now comes very central and very prominent in uh, the way we deal with cities today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned it, the, the neoliberal part of it as well, how we, well, we're going to go back to it, but, uh, you know, all of the policies that changed making zoning and, uh, and housing policies, making this happen, right? I mean, it's not, a, it's not only a, an economic question, it kind of uh, became contagious to all of the rest of the economy somehow, or, oh, sorry, all of the rest of the territory and the fabric of, of, uh, of cities. So, yeah, I, I don't know if there are good traces about how this contamination went from the economy, making the city as the, the champion of the economy towards deregulating housing policies, zoning policies, and all of that. Is, is this already quite well known? Of course, yes. Yeah. Um, as I said, real estate is uh, one of the central commodities of contemporary capitalism. Yeah. So, um, in fact, one of the ways to open the space to this urbanized capitalism was home ownership. Mm. This is one of the ways they did that. So, the, in fact, the neoliberalization of social housing, public housing stocks, public facilities, was a way to fuel an urban economy, because that's where the highest value of real estate was uh, to be found, uh, and also to fuel an urban economy based on debt. Mm. Um, it was a, a very complex construction of financial tools, regulatory tools, and also cultural tools, symbolic tools. The idea was like, now is the time to, in fact, um, um, buy properties in cities. This is your uh, insurance for life. You know, this is uh, the highest value property will uh, remain high value. They will increase value in cities. Uh, this is your insurance. This is your pension. Um, the same, of course, worked for individuals 
then for uh, um, promoters, real estate promoters and, uh, and a real estate investment trust, this was the main commodity of investment. And to do so, what was essential is that the housing market would have been uh, uh, completely neoliberalized. Mm. Um, the commodification of space includes, in fact, this process of allowing uh, private enterprises to actually possess and buy almost every single um, facility and square meter in the city. Now, of course, there are different articulations of this neoliberalization. The neoliberalization of uh, cities like London or New York is very different than that of cities like uh, Amsterdam. Mm. So we have many comparative studies that show there are different formats. Um, so it's very hard to talk about one unique pattern. But what we see is that the trend was liberalize uh, um, uh, property, so make it private. That's essential to acquire debt. Acquisition of debt creates uh, value for the future. With that, you can leverage new debt, new investments. It's a process that allows the grow machine to function. It's a, it lubricates the grow machine. That's yeah. essential for that. Um, the same works for urban land. We see government has started to, in fact, use urban land as an asset to get more uh, um, um, funding, investments yeah. and funding to invest in other activities. And of course, to keep this machine going, what was really essential is that attention and urban growth would never stop. Mm. So that's why government started to invest in all kinds of things that we define commonly as uh, uh, place making or place marketing. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. attracting capital, human and financial capital to cities would allow the value of real estate to go up and up. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was essential for cities to compete with each other. <laughs> uh, Amsterdam started to compete with Barcelona, yeah. started to compete with Brussels mm -hmm. for human capitals, for financial capital. This was essential to allow this value of land and real estate to go up. Mm -hmm. Also, another interesting thing that happened is that governments started to reduce their role, of course, uh, in uh, uh, direct investments on land, but focusing and, and started to focus their investment on specific facilities that would increase or bring increasing in value. For example, in Amsterdam, in it's the, like the monopoly where you have, you know, the the four the railroads yeah. and the <laughs> you have investments, of yeah, course, exactly. in infrastructure, but not only infrastructure. Of course, high speed railways, yeah. airports, exactly, uh, clearly, but actually also symbolic infrastructure. For example, uh -huh. in the two thousand, uh, in the year two thousand, in Amsterdam, the government invested in museums, invested mm. in tourism. <laughs> they imported the "I love New York" yeah. symbols in I love Amsterdam, you know, yeah. or I am Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Yeah. So this was a whole period in which cities became entrepreneurial. Mm. So that's what we call urban entrepreneurialism. Mm -hmm. It was essential to boost markets that were at that time being ne neoliberalized in, in that sense, privatized. Um, so in fact, this is a bit some of the traits, traits uh, or the key ingredients of uh, the neoliberal uh, governance of that time that allowed to make cities uh, powerful markets in national economies. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope it explains a bit in a nutshell uh, yeah. what you were asking. But yeah, yeah, of course. And I think there are two elements that are essential here, which is you mentioned them land and property. Um, and of course, both have a specific role, land as being, well, we try to optimize its value more and more. So we're going to build a residential, we're going to build offices. So therefore, we spatialize the space. Now yeah. it's just an, uh, a non-productive space that is here for financial reasons. And the second is, of course, property that locks or gives to everyone the space, right? There is this uh, privatization of space and land is completely different. Uh, I mean, it's completely um enables or disables future uh, possibilities, right? Mm. So how does this, is, are these these two pieces of the puzzle that are really underlying the, these elements? Yes, yeah? yes, absolutely. Uh, in order to lubricate the urban grow machine, it's essential that land is commodifiable, which mm. means that it needs to be uh, uh, divided into relatively clear, uh, you know, units, Lots, yeah. which are usually overlapped with property rights, private property rights. 
actually the planning this is one of the reasons why we talk we i'm interested in post growth planning is that planning is bounded historically since mm. 100 years mm. to the idea of zoning as a way to divide property yeah. okay in fact zoning was invented in the beginning of the 20th century in the north america in order to guarantee property rights mm. uh, that was the first reason the second was also environmental um, the management of environmental dangers uh, in a you know, um, situation of uh, bad hygiene due to industrialization, et cetera, et cetera. So the definition of land into different property rights and also the clear distinction between different types of land uses, residential, commercial, industrial, is essential to create this land market. Mm. If land is clearly identifi identifiable into one use, you can put a price tag on it. Mm. If you know that that use will stay as such in a certain amount of years as an investor in land, you know what is the price mm. variation in time. Uh, if you know who is the owner of a particular plot of land, you know who to buy it for. Yeah. <laughs> from. Um, this division of land is a completely artificial, as, we, as it's clear, artificial way to separate land uses. Uh, I call it, uh, or we, we know it, as a Euclidean. It's mm. a very essential uh, uh, definition of uh, land uses. It's based mostly on flat maps that do not consider too much the, the height or the underground, in fact. is Euclidean, and it is essential for the grow machine to function. Mm. This actually is a point in which the critique to planning also joins the critique to, uh, of decro economics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which also points at our Euclidean or Cartesian thinking of uh, uh, nature and non-nature, of uh, uh, you know, uh, body and mind, these divisions, dualism, that mm. essentially allow uh, our economy to survive. And the to commodify same, nature and to commodify exactly. people and to commodify, yeah. The same process happens also on land. Mm. And this is also why, uh, in fact, planners always thought about urban and rural, urban and natural mm. as very distinctive features, which, in fact, do not inter interact so much. Um, also, it's the reason why common property rights have been progressively marginalized in planning. For many years, the, the idea was private and public property. This too, pr public property, in fact, is also a single uh, subject property, the state or the government. So in both cases, we have single subjects. If you have common property rights, so cooperatives or other forms of in-between collaborat collaborative property systems, then the system of single property comes, let's say, does not work exactly anymore. You and have to negotiate with... Uh 10 tenants instead of one, you know, it, it gets longer. It's, it's, it's a very different yeah, yeah. process. You put a grain of sand in the machine. Yes. <laughs> Actually, what you say also, the fact that it gets slowly and longer, mm. the market, mm. is also another feature that makes common property rights somehow uh, slowing down the grow machine. Exactly. So cooperative forms are not only you know, very good uh, for uh, decommodifying uh, real estate and, and land, but also are very good to slow down the process of, uh, of uh, urban transformation. Slowing down can be good, especially <laughs> when, it's f when fast transformation requires fast input of materials. Mm. Anyway, this is something maybe we will touch upon later. Mm. Um, but yes, I, I, I try to kind of give an idea of how dividing land into different usages is essential for this land markets and uh, to, work, to function. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we touched upon it uh, at the beginning, but of course, uh, it's important to to take the time now to discuss it. Uh, it's obvious for us, but perhaps let's remind it. There is, we said that cities are essential for uh, growth, economic growth, and on the on the in parallel, there has been a lot of literature that uh, relates growth with economic uh, ecological degradation, right? And therefore cities are responsible for economic degradation. Um, are there some elements, uh, important elements, that you would like to add in this uh, relationship between cities and ecological degradation that we might need to, to 
underline before we go to degrowth, post-growth and all of that? Yes, uh, maybe I should make clear one thing. I'm not an anti-urban uh, <laughs> person. It's actually interesting to see that there is a more and more evidences. Uh, in fact, it's quite a fact that compact living, mm. so uh, dense urban uh, settlements are actually more sustainable than mm. sprawl. Mm. So um, we do know that living together into a relatively small space uh, allows us to have a variety of functions which and at the same time decreasing long long uh, distance mobility which in fact would be an ideal setting for sustainability in that sense however however <laughs> of course this whole story does not work if we take into consideration the opportunities and the easiness to actually you know flying and move far away and also the consumption the individual consumption of people in cities so um, I'm not having an anti-density stance here. Cities are at the moment uh, machines of environmental destruction because they are somehow planned in that way, in a way in which transformation is fast, transformation is driven by consumption, and it's transformation that actually does not consider, consider the impact of that transformation on other parts of the globe. However, is not an anti-density argument. Mm. So maybe we can explore that later, but uh, the idea of living dense in particular urban settlement can be in fact one way to also deal with the climate and ecological uh, you know, uh, destruction of, uh, of, the, of the planet. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, this is the a thousand points questions, this <laughs> density, non-density, what is the right scale, how big is too big and all of that. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. So. Okay, so we know that cities are related to growth. Growth is harming uh, or has uh, ecological, uh, is making, uh, is degrading ecological features. And therefore, well, numerous scholars uh, are urgi urging us to go towards degrowth and postgrowth, which are putting in check our material throughputs and therefore the financial throughput that are attached to it. Um, however, there comes the, the interesting part, and you mentioned it before, you, you said that, well, some of the degrowth and post-growth scholars were not explicit enough with the planning elements. Um, and that's the impression I had, so a couple of weeks ago was the Beyond Growth Conference, mm -hmm. and it was delightful, we heard uh, fantastic uh, speeches, but also... Um, policies about how to make these things happen. I think there was almost no presentation about the city or about a territory. The only one perhaps was Yorgos Kallis on Ikaria Island uh, in Greece about uh, the, the, the lifestyle over there. And I think for me, coming from, from this field, like urban studies and all of this, I, I, I loved everything, but I felt a gap. And... I think that's what uh, we need to, to, to discuss. What are some of the high-level post-growth, degrowth principles that we can, uh, first of all, let's enumerate some that are interesting, and how do they adapt or how do they translate in a, in a city or territorial context, in your opinion? Yeah, um, I, uh, thank you for the question. I was also a bit frustrated, in fact, uh, while well, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, of course, of course. No, no, this is not beyond, a critique, yeah. but it's, it's more I wanted more. I right? agree, yeah. Especially uh, as an urban scholar, exactly. I do necessarily want more about cities. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a bit the, 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 the intention, the job I have. To, I, I feel like I have uh, me and other colleagues to bring this body of uh, critique of uh, capitalism, in fact, of a grow-dependent economy into the city. Mm. And I think... Um, the job is not so difficult, in fact. There are mm. many principles of degrowth and post-growth living that do, uh, do bring really social added value to the way people live in cities. Um, in fact, ultimately, also planners themselves are <laughs> extremely planners operating in a grow economy. Uh -huh. They are extremely concerned with the well-being of people mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. city. In fact, planners are a bit uh, ambiguous. No? On the one end, they uh, promote growth because they think that's necessary in order to bring well-being to the people in the city, in order mm -hmm. to pay for green space, 
for social housing, for hospitals, for trans public transports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in fact, they try to bring this well-being via economic growth. Mm. So the essential, uh, as, uh, uh, let's say, the essential assumption that we need to break is this: that we do need economic, urban economic growth in order to generate well-being. And I think this is a uh, the, the radical mental shift that mm -hmm. degrowth does and that we can bring in also in the planning sphere. We can organize urban space looking directly at well-being of mm -hmm. people, at the way they live, without going through the economic growth. In it's fact, kind of trickle-down economics somehow. <laughs> they, they want somehow from the economic growth that there is some well-being that trickle down to, to the yeah. city. Yeah. It's a trickle-down economics combined with the, I would say, the, the trauma of shrinkage <laughs> in the uh, you know, post-industrial era yeah. where cities were in fact declining. Yeah. So if you take this traumatic experience mm. plus the strength of the trickle-down economics, you get the strong <laughs> convictions of planners that cities must bring jobs, houses, investments, yeah. financial mm, uh, transactions in order to bring well-being. Mm. Well, this is actually, uh, uh, in many cases, a waste of money and mm. energy. If you want, I can give you an example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in Amsterdam, we have, as in Amsterdam, as in many other European cities, we have a, an international financial business district. Mm. This is here called the South Axis. Mm -hmm. It's a very dense environment near a station in the south of Amsterdam, between center, the center of Amsterdam and the airport. Mm -hmm. Key location where all the insurance, financial advisory companies, l l lawyers, all the infrastructure of the financial economy, the global financial economy is located. That's where they are located. This was a deliberate plan of the Amsterdam administration since the late 90s to bring that function there and to mm -hmm. build a business district that would just help that economy. That business district, district is today still not livable for the people of there. Course. It's a you know mostly office space. A ghost town, yeah in the night, absolutely. Mm. Uh, and also what we see is that there is continuous, every five years, continuous massive investments in order to make that space livable. <laughs> so in fact, we, at the moment, their plan is to invest 4 billion euros to put infrastructure underground, to build a, guard, a, a park, to bring in housing of different types, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is a whole planning in order to make that space livable. But it was planned for an economy, in fact, that is completely, completely fictitious. In fact, the Netherlands is a fiscal paradise. We know it. Every year, there are 4,000 billion euros coming in the Netherlands and 4,000 coming out of the <laughs> Netherlands. Of those transactions, just a minimum part ends up. Yeah. trickles down, in fact, to the, to the uh, space where people live. Mm. So we built a whole infrastructure for a financial economy that, in fact, brings no value to the people living in that area. And it's becoming, indeed, a project that needs a lot of public investments to, to deliver quality. So the, qu the question is, why do we do that in the first place? We could actually plan for an economy that brings value social collective value directly without going through this whole infrastructure investments uh, that eventually don't turn out to be so so uh, positive for yeah. people living there. The same works with uh, airports. I mean, uh, of course, 70% of the flights of Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam are exchange flights. Mm. Uh, there are repeat, there are more and more studies that shows that the added value of the uh, airport economy around Schiphol is not as great as we expected. There are some basic assumptions in policymakers that need to be, in fact, debunked. So to go back to your question, the essential shift, I think, is to think of cities as sites for well-being and mm. think of planning as a, a direct concern towards well-being rather than, you know... Uh, Think it as a, as a, you know, a, you know, the the lubricant of the grow machine that eventually turns out into uh, into quality and well-being. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we we should do uh, if we take T growth and post growth seriously. You, you you use that as well. I think in the book you call it uh, decolonize imagination or something like that. Too. Of the planner. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. To 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 try to understand as well as you say to to go directly th towards the well-being and not somehow by 
by having the global financial market uh, satisfied that we also get some piece of the pie uh, in order to, to satisfy our, uh, our green spaces or something like that. Um, I'm, so we're going to get to some initiatives, I think, later, uh, be it cooperatives and others. Um, I think there is also some other concepts that we could integrate in this discussion, which are, so let, if post-growth and degrowth are rather destination uh, concepts or more uh, visions, we also have some more operational concepts, which might be the circular economy. Um, some others might be, uh, well, I don't know if donut economics is a... Where, where do I situate it itself? But, um, you know, Amsterdam is very active in these concepts as well. Yes. The city itself is very proactively saying that it's going to achieve, I don't know how much percentage of circularity by 2050, is it a 50 or 100, you know, some ludicrous uh, numbers. But how do you see these more operational concepts uh, embed themselves into, um, you know, larger visions that are post-growth and degrowth? Yeah. Um, yes, you're right. Amsterdam, for me, it's a perfect uh, site where <laughs> yeah, to exactly, study this process. Exactly. Actually, Amsterdam is usually uh, one of the first in Europe to import uh, yeah. different kinds of concepts. Like in terms of city. branding, I have to admit that... Uh, they invest a lot in uh, yeah. PR and this kind of things, yes. And that allows me to study these uh, <laughs> developments right yeah. when they happen. So I am uh, lucky in that sense. Um, so, in fact... When we understand how these concepts that um, float in space in the yeah. debate in Europe and, uh, and beyond land to the city, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we should go back to what I said before. The cities are the national champion of economy. It's mm -hmm. where there is the dynamic. So it's actually pretty obvious that these economics concepts come to the city and get appropriated and, and you know, used by urban policymakers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's quite, uh, or nowadays, it's quite actually a standard process there are you know scholarships research produces concept and then cities make something with them now um you mentioned two key concepts the uh -huh. donut economics and the circular economy let's start with the donut because uh, it's quite amsterdam is quite known in fact for this uh, type of uh, um, for having worked with the donut economics framework by kate roworth mm -hmm. donut economics framework is a post growth framework mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a it's a, a framework that uh, questions uh, the ecological ceiling of a particular economy. In this case, the urban economy, and questions also the foundation, uh, the, the social foundation of this economy. So it's a post-growth uh, concept because it says that we cannot go, uh, you know, and grow, grow, grow. Uh, that would uh, make the economy overshooting the ecological ceiling. Uh, and brings back, of course, the idea that we need to focus on the well-being, on the essential needs uh, of uh, people in order to improve them. So it's obviously a post-growth concept. Now, when it gets applied to the city, mm -hmm. this is a framework that very well allows to map overshooting and underreaching. Mm -hmm. So the city of Amsterdam, as many other cities working with Kate Rovers agency, in fact, very well mapping where they're overshooting and where are underreaching. They show, for example, that uh, in the last 10 years, um, um, the economy was performing very well, but uh, um, the uh, personal um, life satisfaction of people was not. In fact, we mm. increased, we had an increase in loneliness, we had an increase in mental uh, issues. Uh, we had also an increase in community, commuting times. So we see that there was a, you know, a decreasing of those elements of the foundational economy. So in fact, this donut allows very well to map these trends. However, what the donut does not do, mm. and that's very important for a degrowth perspective, mm. is that it does not tell governments, urban governments, where to reduce and where to increase. Mm. Uh, or how, let's say, how to reduce and how to increase. Mm. Um, it does not tell you, you have to look, for example, at the uh, harbor and at the fossil fuel that mm. is stored there. Or it, tell, it doesn't tell you, oh, you have to look at the airport mm. and at the, at the environmental impact of that facility. This is something that come up with the discussion around the donut, okay. or at least it should. 
Now, from my perspective, this discussion, these big facilities, for example, that I just mentioned, were left out of the discussion around the donut uh, strategy of the city mm. of Amsterdam. Um, so it's more of a diagnosis exactly. tool. Exactly. Yeah. It is a diagnosis tool. Mm. The degrowth perspective is more than that. The mm. degrowth perspective tells you you need to reduce excess. Mm. To reduce excess, you need to look at where the wealth is concentrated, mm. so where that excess is uh, performed. You, look at, you need to look and target those social groups that emit the most, those uh, activities that emit the most and do not bring social value. Mm. And you need to give back to those groups that don't meet basic uh, standards. And to do that, you need to tax, you need to cap, you need to uh, expropriate eventually. These are actually uh, very delicate political issues mm -hmm. that come up in the moment in which we take seriously the fact that we cannot overshoot ecological boundaries. Mm -hmm. So the donut is useful for that, but if the political debate and the way the debate is organized that not, does not address those issues, then it gets emptied of mm -hmm. its radical values. Mm -hmm. And that's the risk. It's um, a bit of a, you know, what scholars in urban geography call the post-political mm -hmm. approach to these issues. Exactly. You discuss about the donut, you find out what are the, 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 the overshooting and underreaching sectors, but eventually you don't bring up the key issue, the elephant in the room, which is <laughs> accumulation of wealth, yeah. uh, luxury consumption, uh, private properties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is for the donut. Uh -huh. You asked me about the circular economy. Exactly, exactly. In fact, in Amsterdam, the two come together. Yeah, so uh, for, for the small history, uh, yeah. it was first the circular economy for a couple of years, five years or so, and two or three years later came the, the donut economy. Yeah. The same thing happened in Brussels, so I have a very close affinity to what happened in Brussels. I followed it very much, so I'm curious to hear yeah. your story about the uh, circular economy. Yeah. Yeah, for the circular economy, it happened the same. We had a concept that was coming from the European Union and from the national government in the Netherlands, in fact, uh, that got urbanized. Uh, this happened in the mid-2000s, uh, uh, 2010, 12, 15, in Amsterdam in particular. There, uh, what happened is that uh, at one point, the idea of circularity got contested. There were different factions using uh -huh, it. Uh -huh. In fact, in a recent writing, uh, uh, I call it uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the circular economy. Uh, you know, referring to the to the movie by Sergio Leone, where yeah. we see three bandits trying to get to the gold, and the gold is, in fact, uh, secondary materials, a waste. That's what the circular economy needs to yeah. thrive, right? Needs some sort of obsolete product that can be repurposed, remanufactured, repaired. That's essential, and that's why these three circular economies are somehow, you know, fighting with each other to get that material, that stuff. And in the city, we see this happening very well. Uh, in the city, we have different flows of materials that can be valorized through circular economy policies. There is waste, of course. That waste at the moment goes mostly to the incinerator. Uh, the incinerator produces what they call green energy with it. <laughs> yeah, it's a heat. Course. Yeah. Uh, to, in fact, um, heat houses and disconnect them from natural gas, which is considered a fossil, of course, uh, fuel. So uh, this is one way to think about circularity. It's, uh, uh, let's say, the bad way yeah. to think about it. Uh, it's a way that valorizes waste but doesn't generate really high value and certainly does not reduce the cause of the problem, which is waste itself. We actually thrive out of it. Um, but there's also other ways to think about the same. For example, uh, um, we see many movements in the city, social movements that are claiming for appropriating the organic waste. Mm. Organic waste, which is an extremely valuable waste ecologically and socially because it's around which you create food, which is essential for the well-being of people. In order to appropriate this organic waste, we need to divert it from <laughs> this flow that yeah, brings yeah. it to the to the incinerator, which makes the the incinerator obsolete as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, we see here a conflict over a resource, which is the waste produced by the city, and this is a conflict that uh, uh, can be solved in two ways. Right. On one end, you can of course produce more waste, <laughs> and then everybody has a bit of it. Yeah. That would be the paradox of yeah. the circular economy. Yeah. So we do not question wasteful consumption because waste is necessary 
for all these circularities to thrive. The other way would be to aggressively reduce waste mm. and to tackle the source of it, which is urban consumption and production. That's the degrow perspective. By tackling that side, we reduce it. But at the same time, we also divert into what I call the good circular economy, which is a social and ecological reuse of waste. And this is the case of the organic mass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But of course, we can do the same, think about the same when we take the building and construction and demolition waste. The same when we talk about electronics, mm -hmm. um, plastic, clothing. Uh, it's the same story. So we see dif different circularity that play or conflict uh, with each other in the city. It's extremely interesting to see, in fact. Um, and that's why I, I think there is a point at which the circular economy narrative or the circular metabolism narrative does coincide with the degrowth narrative. Mm. There is a point in which we see that the circular reuse of materials can be uh, embedded in an economy that it slows down, yeah. that downscales material flows, and that makes those material flows, in fact, functional to the social and ecological well-being of the people living in the city. Yeah, I mean, it comes as, as, as a last element, right? First you reduce, and then with what you reduce, you, you then only circularize. So good, bad, what's the ugly? The ugly, in fact, was when I was doing research on this circular economy discourses and infrastructures, I realized that there was, um, there were large waste companies, which are in fact are uh, multinationals like mm. uh, Suez uh, or Renewi or Remondes. Um, these were companies that in fact um, were developing infrastructure to deal with large amount of waste coming from the city, inspired by the idea of urban mining, right? Uh, what they were also doing is that uh, they were not keeping this as their core business, like uh, the incinerator with the uh, heat, but they were m embedding them in other functions, mostly related to water mm. and energy. Um, so they were actually saying, okay, we, we are able to deal with very large masses of waste in a way that produces secondary materials that can be reused for economies that are actually urban, like uh, indeed uh, repurposing economy. Now, they're ugly, so they're not ideal, because they do thrive out of uh, waste, of course. They do need that. On the other hand, I define them ugly and not bad, because uh, they have uh, an infrastructure that is becoming more and more local that can, in fact, deal with the current large waste streams produced by cities in a way that is more and more regional and not global. So they do not export. They try as much as possible to process them within the region. And also in a way that kind of speaks to new enterprises that are doing, in fact, quite interesting innovation with that uh, waste. Um, so it is a different, some sort of ambiguous form of circular economy. Now, um, of course, I'm not talking about profit, private property here and, and, and uh, labor rights. So, but we see that it's possible to regulate these functions in a way that, you know, uh, uh, workers' rights are matched. And if I can give one example, in the mid 2000s, we saw that in Amsterdam, electronic waste got um, regionalized. So eventually, electronic waste was obviously one of the main exported type of waste uh, with all kinds of consequences in terms of human rights and land uh, and uh, impact on land and ecology. What we see in the mid 2000s is that, in fact, companies affiliated with this, um, this uh, uh, organization start to create electronic waste hubs around Amsterdam. At the moment, we have three of them. Mm -hmm. They do these hubs uh, in a way that it's easier to pick up the waste from the consumers, bring them there, so short distance. In those hubs, they employ uh, people with relatively fair and good conditions. Uh, that um, allow them to dis disassemble these products and bring them back into production that is actually within, at least within uh, the country uh, at the moment. So this was a localization of the waste stream of uh, electronic waste, which in fact allowed to you know, reuse, uh, repurpose this kind of products, which in fact are extremely dangerous, uh, extremely uh, polluting. So it's a 
ugly form because it thrives out of waste. But mm. I, w I would not define it as the evil, like uh, <laughs> the so-called vacuum cleaner, which is the yeah. incinerator, you know, things like this. Um, I think it's very interesting that the last part you mentioned as well with the, uh, how you call it, well, the regionalization of waste, we start thinking again in terms of land, yeah. right? Where are we going to put these infrastructure and what are they going to replace? And I think this might be the, the, a segue to this post-growth planner because the post-growth planner most certainly not only needs to reduce new constructions, new developments that are just there for a financial stake and not for well-being, but also that person needs to figure out what are the resources of a city. Mm -hmm. uh, land, of course, people, uh, secondary resources in terms of materials, and how to juggle with that, right? And I think, well, th that's the, the biggest equation right now, is to figure out once you have a hectare of space, what do you do with it today in a city? Do you grow vegetables? Do you put a circular economy <laughs> activity? Do you keep it for later? Uh, do you put trees for, uh, for carbon or green space? And these are things that I don't have an answer for. I don't know if you have an answer for it. <laughs> and how do you feel this post-growth planner fit into these questions? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's difficult to decide what to do on each square <laughs> of course, meter of land. Yeah. And, uh, but at least what we can say is that uh, it should not be a pure private uh, property choice. Mm. So at least we have public debate on what to do on land. That would be the main condition uh, uh, in a democratic process to decide what to do on that land. That would be the main condition for a post growth planning practice. Um, now, it is essential to envision a post growth city and it's really difficult mm. we do not have yet a vision of how a post grow urbanization would work mm. however the post grow degrow degrow literature gives us many good indications and one of the indication i think that i take on board when i work on this is the idea of autonomy now autonomy is mostly understood uh, in terms of political and uh, you know autonomy uh, but also autonomy from the ideology of growth, right? So it's, it's a social cultural process as well. Now, why not? And I think we should also understand that idea of autonomy in, in terms of biophysical and infrastructural terms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, at the moment, cities, because they were the urban growth machines, became not autonomous at all. We do not produce anything that the city needs within the boundaries of the city. Or when I talk about cities, I talk about regions. Yeah. Not the, even labor, actually. That's yeah. Not even labor, exactly. Yeah. In fact, cities are the least autonomous entities <laughs> we can imagine within an economy. Uh, if a global value chain uh, breaks for any reason, cities will suffer. Yeah. It's an extremely dangerous situation, of course. If the economy collapses, there will be a huge concentration of uh, drama within the city. And that's why shrinkage is this traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. So cities are not autonomous, and that's essential. And if they're not biophysically autonomous, they're also not politically autonomous. Mm. All the big decisions that impact on cities are taken somewhere else, at the European level, international level. In fact, uh, all decisions about the financial economy, about the commodities economy, are taken somewhere else, not within cities. In fact, mayors are pretty, pretty powerless in, mm. in relative to those decisions. So... I think one of the main indications of the degrowth scholarship for planners is autonomy in terms of bio biophysical and, bio pol and political terms. Now, fortunately, there is a lot of literature and research in urban planning historically that have dealt with this issue. Already the idea of the garden city uh, mm. of uh, Benet and Howard uh, at the beginning of the 20th century was thinking in terms of a polycentric system of urban settlements which would um, have uh, cooperation linkages, so connect to each other in order to exchange fundamental resources, but also be autonomous and surrounded by natural and rural areas. There was already one vision of an autonomous region. Mm. Then we had also the whole idea of a bioregion that is still very popular today, where we think about systems of uh, human settlements embedded in a very peculiar and particular ecosystem uh, uh, landscapes. And these settlements thrive out of a specific peculiarity of this landscape. Mm. 
uh, this bioregional concept is very useful for planners because it tells something very simple. It says, in order to think about a thriving economy for the city, you need to look at what is the uh, ecosystem around the city, what does produces, what is the particular properties. So this is already another avenue of thinking. But in general, I think uh, the autonomy, the idea of autonomy can be very useful for imagining an urban uh, post-growth future. Also, I like very much to refer to the idea of uh, uh, the bioregion as developed by uh, uh, Bookchin, so the most anarchic uh, perspective on it. Uh, there we see uh, an idea of urbanization that is uh, very um, based on, on uh, um, settlements that are governed as much as possible democratically and that uh, cooperate into some sort of federations where they exchange resources. Now, this system is in place, some in the, in, we see them happening, in fact, at the, within the cracks of the, of the grow urban economy, we see that happening. For example, as an example of this federation of uh -huh. relatively autonomous um, governing bodies, I always use the Mitz Oyser Syndicat in, okay. uh, in Germany. It's, a, it's an organization, it's a federation of housing cooperatives in Germany that basically organize and coordinate housing cooperatives around, uh, um, over the entire country. It's a cooperative, therefore it's owned by the members. This cooperative owns half of the cooperatives of each real estate in the mm -hmm. country. And this allows them to transfer knowledge, to help each other, and also avoid that those cooperative housing gets indeed privatized and financialized. It's a by region, it's a, it's a, sorry, it's a federation because it is built from the bottom up and it is very much uh, polycentric because it, it reunites different housing cooperatives along the country. Now, another example is the community supported agriculture system. We have many networks of community supported agriculture within regions that coordinate with each other in order to, uh, of course, cater for their need of uh, logistics. For example, they are also built from the bottom up. Uh, they are grassroots rooted, in fact, and uh, uh, they do organize in that sense, in this case, food supply in a way mm. that caters for the demand of the place, first of all. Now, these are not urban complex entities as such, but they give us an indication of how autonomy would work uh, in an urban uh, environment. Um, now, in order for that autonomy to work, we need, of course, to slow down the metabolism of the city, consume less, of course. We need to downscale it. So, sorry, consume slowlier and consume less. We need to make it last longer and be thinner, the metabolism of the city. And of course, we can, of course, close also the metabolism of the city. These are essential terms that allow us to, to understand how these autonomous cities would work. Mm. And, um, well, of course, this idea of commons and this idea of cooperatives, can you see it be translated to all the essential functions of a city, so mobility, food, housing, education, and all that, would that be kind of a, a bottom-up uh, interlinkage of cooperatives that kind of uh, intermingle at different spatial scales? So that, that is a bit how we could yeah. operationalize it? Yeah, the, 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 the question of how to articulate mm. this, uh, you know, this urban services, um, within the state, in fact, it's, it's, it's crucial. And now I always imagine it more like a public common form of partnership. So you have essential framework rules that are enforced and set in place by public authorities, governments that allow, for example, to guarantee a certain amount of social housing everywhere, certain amount of public space everywhere, but also organize system of public health and transportation. This is functions that the public can fulfill because they are essential function and should not be for profit. Water services, water infrastructure, another example where the public ownership of this infrastructure is crucial. However, this infrastructure cannot work properly if it's not connected to an infrastructure of, in fact, collaborative and cooperative forms of uh, uh, management and property 
of uh, other functions. Mm. So we imagine a system with different layers and it's essential in order to reach services and provide services of the best quality right there where they are needed. And when we see how the state behaved in the past, we know also that sometimes has shortcomings by delivering uh, services that are directly you know, benefiting the users. In this sense, cooperatives are much more effective. Mm. The case of housing, it's, it's uh, probably the most easy to explain. In housing, ideally, we, ha we will have public housing that deliver housing to those that really don't have the means to, to access cooperatives, for example. Um, but also we have a system of housing cooperatives that work together in synergy that uh, um, it's basically providing housing to dwellers that own at the same time their own property. Mm. Housing cooperatives are essential. Why? Because they are very good in avoiding the commodification of the housing stock, especially if there are um, uh, limited equity cooperatives or no equity co cooperatives, and they are very well, if they are democratically organized, they work very well to, to avoid that uh, housing units gets privatized and eventually fall in the, in the private market. While uh, we know that public housing have been progressively also privatized. So in fact, pri pr public housing in that sense needs to be protected. So against neoliberalization derivatives, of course, they're, they're, you know, uh, side uh, you know trends and uh, the cooperative sector needs to be nurtured in order to offer that that type of uh, housing that is uh, suitable customized and it's managed by the people living in them mm. um, so this is how we can envision i think uh, uh, let's say a state that is somehow organized around public common interest um, and cities today many cities of europe offer many examples of how this can be done. For example, the, the common use regulations in Naples is another example where uh, the government assigned the right to management to collectives of uh, non-residential estates, in this case, cultural estates. Um, we have here in Amsterdam the free so-called free space uh, uh, tool, which allows government to give use of land, uh, public land to collectives uh, and allows them to be there and fulfill their social and cultural and political functions. So there are all different kind of models in cities that we see work in that direction a pub as a public common partnership. Yeah. Um, before we go back to the planning elements, uh, there is... Uh, it, it's, a, it's an element I haven't managed to, to, to figure out. So. Of course, we need to reduce, right? This is a given. We need to slow. We need to reduce. That's a given. Now, what happens when... How do you deal with flows of people? Meaning, um, right now, cities, because they're economic growth machines, attract people to fulfill this and to operate this machine, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think in the future, because this will not be its primary role, there won't be a certain influx? Uh, we talked about commuting as well before. Will it be more balanced? I'm, I'm asking this because, you know, there is always this, uh, this bad comparison or this bad uh, element where people say, well, you know, we need housing, right? Mm. This nobody can uh, disagree with. Right? Of course, we need more schools, we need more housing, we need more quality housing. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, this is also post-political. What type of housing and for who and how? Yeah. And so it's a bit hard to answer this question about will a city stop to grow physically? Uh, do we need to put a, a tentative border uh, or not? You know, w what happens there? I, I have difficulties to imagine it and I think this goes back to your bioregional concept and all of this how polycentric it is how not but uh, do you have any reflections on, on this yeah you know, yes it's it's a very complex question I mean we, we don't know also how the future will look of like course, yeah. we don't have a blueprint and we should not but what we what I want to make clear is that 
Um, the growth we're talking about is not the growth in people. Mm. So it's a growth in financial economic transactions mm. and in material uh, material transactions. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we, we are not talking about cities that stop uh, welcoming uh, people. Quite the contrary. In fact, if we al arrive to a form of urban living mm. um, that is not centered around consumption, uh, then we can, and, production, and increasing production, then we can imagine a very dense urban environment that has a low mm. ecological footprint. Mm. So density per se, in fact, does not, is not good or bad. Mm. It's really about what type of consumption pattern and what type of productions that density produces. So um, I, I believe, of course, that uh, the mega cities have been, are some sort of uh, today, on the one hand, monstrous, on the one hand, fascinating form of urbanization that is specifically uh, reflecting the grow economy. Um, they are mega cities because they bring labor to a high concentration uh, in order to maximize, in fact, the production uh, uh, um, and consumption of uh, goods and services. They are not mega cities because people decided all of a sudden mm. to go and live all close together in 20, 30 billion, uh, billion, uh, 20, 30 million, million people, people yeah. together. So the mega city as we know it, it's a product of the urbanized grow economy. Mm. What we do, however, know is that there are some uh, regional systems that include millions of people that have reached higher degrees of livability and try constantly to reduce their ecological footprint. And to do that, they indeed concentrate on uh, polycentric settlements, so smaller centers that are connected by public transportation and that are surrounded, in fact, by uh, uh, land that is uh, productive for the well-being of those people living there, and that, to a certain degree, reduce unnecessary forms of consumption. This is a system that would, I think, be closer to an idea of a post-growth uh -huh. city. But it's a system that, if it's well uh, organized, I think can host an increase in urban population. But That's, uh, let, let's uh, continue on this thought. Yeah. So is this for existing or what do you do with current megacities, right? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's imagine we go to this post yes. but what do we do with the current urbanites and the current yes. megacities? Do we redistribute them to these new poles? Uh, will that consume more materials? You know, it, yeah, it's yeah. kind of a never-ending uh, yes. question. I'm asking this because, you know, I, I know it's impossible to have an answer, but you have thought of this and I'm yes. curious to... First of all, what uh, we could do, uh, we could downscale all the functions that are ecologically destructive and mm -hmm. do not bring well-being for society. If we do that, we free up an incredible amount, incredible mm -hmm. amount of space within the city. I'm talking about uh, fossil fuel storage, chemical companies, airports, landing zone for airports, uh, highways, uh, many business districts for the financial economy, <laughs> um, of course, retail areas, uh, commercial centers, and of course, uh, intensive uh, agriculture uh, or intensive. Uh, um, so, so this kind, of, this kind of functions can be downscaled. If we downscale those functions, then we have we don't have scarcity of space. I mean, um, we will have actually an abundance of space where we can do many other things. We can, in fact, provide essential services that are needed. Housing, first of all. Uh, gardens, yes, of course. Other facilities, healthcare, um, um, schools, um, cultural centers, uh, universities. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these are areas that would be available for new types of development. Is what we can call as a, you know, a reconversion or retrofitting. We do that all the time as planners. Actually, uh, maybe you may not be aware, but nowadays there is a, a, a proposal by the European uh, uh, Union to actually have a no net land take mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, framework, which would allow basically would, would be a quite important tool to say to cities, whatever you do, you cannot expand, you cannot cover soil, you need to reconvert soils that you don't use anymore 
in order to have more uh, available space for your new developments. But I think this is an interesting development which promotes the reconversion. Mm -hmm. We need to basically divest from the fossil infrastructure mm -hmm. and use that infrastructure for the well-being. And there are examples in cities that have been do doing so. Like in Valencia, you know, there was this uh, 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 ring, ring road that was reconverted in, in, a, in a huge linear park. Um, we have in Amsterdam a policies of low, auto-low policy. It's a small-scale policy relative to the big fossil infrastructure, but it shows that we can reduce car uh, space and give it back to other functions. These are just, you know, the type of the low-hanging fruit that of this reconversion of space. I think if we instigate this process, we will already have a step, we will already be a step further in dealing with the so-called overpopulation. Mm -hmm. Of course, these divestments would be also functional to reduce the source of environmental destruction, which in turn, hopefully, will be also uh, uh, able to reduce the mass climate migration that we have today due to the inhabitability of major parts of the world. Um, this is part of this project, I would say, or this you know, vision. On the other hand, again, bringing quality functions in the smaller towns and centers will also allow to block this migration of human capitals or brain drain that we have constantly from small centers to the bigger cities. This is also a planning question, not urban planning, but actually a national spatial planning question to allow for a minimum basic standard of essential urban services in all towns existing today. Mm. In fact, we could say if degrowth is for universal basic income and for universal basic services, we can say that degrowth planning is for universal urban basic services. So housing, uh, public public transportation, green space, biodiversity, and of course, um, air quality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, this is a way we could also, uh, indeed, improve the conditions in th those areas that today are in fact shrinking in and losing the competition against the the, the bigger city centers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we now have an idea of what is this role of the post-growth planning and the post-growth planner as well, which seems to always, well, planners and architects seem to have like an impossible choice to make, uh, <laughs> as you mentioned before. Uh, they're, they're quite schizophrenic, you know, they, they need to somehow fit all of the needs and all of the constraints with maintaining economic growth. So uh, I'm curious, yeah, you, you had an entire chapter over here about what is the role of this post-growth planner for, for the future? Um, and you also had the, the manifesto of, uh, <laughs> yes. of post-growth. I don't know if you want to, to touch, touch upon these, uh, these elements. Yeah, I think uh, in, in the last part of the book, in fact, we asked ourselves, uh, me and my uh, colleagues, uh, w planners are in many cases people that really want the well-being of people, uh, of, of the the. the, the, the inhabitants of their cities and the cities where they work and we were asking ourselves why do, don't they do embrace more this post-growth degrowth ideals and so we decided to ask them what they think about it and what we found out in fact um, in particular uh, a colleague of mine from Groningen University Christian uh, Lamker what he found out is in that many planners do have post-growth ideals uh, as a principles and ethical principles in their practice, but they find it very hard to break down this machine attitude uh, and, and actually overcome this trauma of sh shrinkage. Um, however, I think there are the seeds of change there because cities are the places where you see very clearly the effect of economic growth on the well-being of people. Mm. You see very clearly evictions, you see very clearly people who cannot afford housing, you see very clearly the stress related to commuting, uh, the danger and the death due to, uh, to car mobility and highways. So you, you see this um, very clearly. Um, of course, um, the job of the planner is also to be very clear, not the one of uh, deciding 
top down what the city should be, a degrowth city should be. That would be a misunderstanding. The role of a post-growth planner is to uh, embrace diversity, to include as much as possible different marginalized group of the policy process, to uh, take their input seriously, uh, to enable this democratic process of decision making, and to in fact spatially organize the type of input that is being given or advise that. And also to, in fact, give give the space to collectives and cooperatives to, uh, to in fact, develop their own system of uh, living convivially and sufficiently. That's the role of the post planner. We are not thinking in terms of, uh, you know, a planner like a technocrat of yeah. degrowth that would be uh, completely against the principle. Um, but this is in line with what the grow literature and scholarship and practices already showed. If you ask people what they want for their well-being, they will not tell you, I want a new airport, but I will, they will tell you, I want a school for my kids, I want green space. So it's actually a process that it's quite, um, it would come quite, I would say, uh, naturally, if we would take post-growth principles uh, seriously. And in the, in the manifesto in the book, we just try to list 10 of these principles that can be taken as a guide, guideline for planners and both professional and non-professional planners, people who deal with spatial change and spatial usage in their, in their daily work. Um, before we end, I, I want to do an exercise with you. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's say that we have uh, the task of making Amsterdam uh, post-growth. Uh, wh- what are the steps? Wh- where do we start with? Uh, what are some intermediary steps? And how do we then realize that finally Amsterdam is post-growth? Yeah. Thank you for this question. Actually, I had uh, just two weeks ago a meeting with many architects, uh-huh. designers from municipalities asking the same question. How do we do it? Well, obviously, I don't have a clear answer. That's you don't have it? <laughs> no, but, uh, but we can start, as I said, from few from few steps. Yeah. Uh, actually, the city of Amsterdam already said, okay, we're taking the donut as a, as a way to map our overshoot and, uh, and uh, our underreach. Yes. Okay, let's take that seriously mm-hmm. and do, first of all, a survey of where are these areas of underreach mm. and what are the sectors at the most dangerous but at the same time also w- which are the functions that are the most ecologically destructive and the one that do not bring direct well-being to the inhabitants of the city so that's the first step and that can and be and done how already how do you do that how, how do you manage to you know to make this link because it's a complicated link to to figure out i think we we should start with questioning the major infrastructures of the mm. city and to to read carefully the studies that have been produced and that show that the actual social value of those infrastructure is not so great neither in terms of uh, indeed uh, social value for the collectivity of the people in the city nor for in terms of jobs in terms of quantity of jobs we need to question the financial economy, the financial district of the city. And the same works with retail. We know that there are some retail areas that don't perform uh, as was hoped. So this surveying, survey before plan, it was a bit of <laughs> you know, the slogan of the modernist planning, but this surveying can be done, but it's a surveying that can be done also by asking urban inhabitants what are the functions that they, they value the most. And in the book, in fact, there is a chapter where people asked during the COVID pandemic, what made their living better during mm. the lockdown? This is a f- first basic step. The other basic step, I think, is to identify to identify areas of downscaling, so key sites where we really need to retrofit a complete downscale infrastructure. So it's kind of phasing out fossil phasing fuels, out. So fossil infrastructure. In- infrastructure, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Then we need to work hard on um, the property system mm. <laughs> of the most essential commodity of cities, which is housing. Mm. There, uh, we need to tackle uh, real estate investment trusts that have multiple uh, houses in property and that lead eventually to speculative uh, markets and therefore unaffordable prices. We need to deal with that property system in order to, in fact, give back to uh, public housing, which is now suffering and needs to be uh, re-energized dramatically that's not clearly a material uh, you know degrowth side but it's a yeah. political important very very important step to take 
and this you you confiscate you well, buy yeah you we, i think this is uh, we should spoke we should uh, bring all the options in the table mm. and the political discussion discussion and not and avoid post-political yes. uh, consensus building processes and politicize, politicize housing property and if we do that seriously we can do for example what berlin did uh, to to talk about what is excessive home ownership they identified you know companies with more than uh, than uh, 3000 houses mm. as excessive we can do the same in Amsterdam we can mm. think about that but we can also um, and this is already happening we can use those tools that allows to 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 um, to slow down the uh, the housing market and to bring it back to the uh, uh, real need of uh, real urgency of housing affordability and for example anti speculation rulings like you cannot buy a property if you don't live in it mm -hmm. at least for five ten years this mm -hmm. is one way to do that the other is give land to cooperatives and tools and subsidies to them which they are not obviously not speculative forms of home ownership this is another rule the other is a uh, 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 regulating private rent in a way that makes it uh, less difficult to buy it for investments and and easier to rent it stably for an affordable price. These are all, in fact, all planning norms, regulations that we have already, and we can use systematically to move to a, a city that is oriented towards well-being. So, in fact, to summarize, there are policies for reduction, mm -hmm. divestment, mm -hmm. uh, phasing out, and there are policies for you know improvement. Uh, increase in fact uh, of those facilities basic services that are needed for the well-being of the cities it's two types of movement and that's that's i think essential in the degrowth uh, framework the degrowth de de vision to to take into consideration but uh, well i can go on and on but i think all of this would be possible in fact if we have a a, a very a system of, uh, of democratic decision making that is uh, uh, diffuse and rooted in the in the in the city, not top down, but you know that respects different neighborhoods, their identity, their physical historical identity, uh, that respect the, um, the the inhabitants of these neighborhoods and includes them in a way that is accessible. This is a form of decentralized planning that uh, I think would be uh, important to set up for for a post grow uh, city. Let's see if uh, Amsterdam will also champion this uh, marketing <laughs> endeavor of uh, of post growth or not. Um, any last topics we we haven't covered? Oh, <laughs> difficult question. Um, no, I think we we addressed uh, many. I am very happy of this conversation. I have to say. I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> uh, any books? I mean, of course, there is this collective book of uh, post-growth planning. I see here uh, the Turning Up the Heat oh, yes. uh, from uh, Maria Kaika and colleagues as well. Is yeah. there any articles, books or movies that discuss either the city and the growth machine, either imaginaries of post-growth or or something completely different that yeah. you would like to inspire us uh, with? Um, there are many books and I, I would say, uh, you know, uh, it's there are many, many books, also older books about mm. planning that could uh, represent a bit of post-grow idea. Um, rather than giving one or two titles, I think um, what what I'm doing now, and this will come soon uh, public uh, in, a, in a month or two, uh, I am building, a, in fact, a repository mm. of all um, uh, works on urban degrowth mm. uh, out there, uh, together with colleagues. And this will be online and will be the name, and probably this is the first time I say it in public, will be the <laughs> Post Growth City Coalition. Nice. Uh, and uh, um, it's in progress. And I'm going to indeed uh, bring together all these works about cities and degrowth in order to also give visibility to this um, stream of thought that is actually out there but sometimes it doesn't get visible mm. uh, enough um, so yeah that's that's what i'm trying to do now it's a bit uh, the challenge um, but yeah i already i would be already very happy if people start thinking in terms of urban degrowth 
uh, in a way to fill this gap that I think it's there in the in the degrowth um, debate. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm very excited about this future. I think it's it's getting there. Uh, there is signs, there is early warning signals that uh, we have infiltrated the, <laughs> the minds and the and the souls of some people. Uh, to finish, you also have a blog. Oh yes, <laughs> and you share recipes as well in also, your blog. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Would uh, you like to share a recipe with us? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I don't remember the last one. I have to say the blog is uh, it's from for for uh, organ uh, so, uh, taken care by me and uh, my partner Miriam Meisner, also a degrowth scholar. And uh, you know, s since we joined uh, movements like Extinction Rebellion, Scientist Rebellion, at one point we were a bit frustrated because we needed an outlet for the most uh, explicit uh, arguments <laughs> about uh, I think uh, ecological and climate justice. So we decided to open this blog. Uh, the title is uh, Save the Planet Amateurs. And the idea is that uh, there is no expert on saving the planet. We're all amateurs, also you know, scholars, and, and we learn together. And there we share every single thing, single thing that we feel like sharing, including recipes, rigor rigorously vegan recipes. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I invite uh, the listeners to have a look at the, at the blog. Um, It's planetamateur.com. Uh, yeah, it? planetamateur.com. Yeah. Um, thank you for mentioning it. In <laughs> fact, I always forget. And uh, it's a way for us to indeed uh, share our thoughts. And, uh, and yes. I will try some of your recipes. I think <laughs> one you. was on uh, pasta with uh, Brussels sprouts or something. Oh, like yes, that. yes. Yeah. <laughs> very easy to do. Everything is very easy to do there. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, uh, Federico, for this uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, thanks as well to you all for listening, joining. Uh, don't hesitate to, to let us know what you have thought of this. Are you a planner? Are you a practitioner? Are you a scholar in these topics? Let us know where you are situated in this. I think the discussion is necessary. We're still at the very beginning of these um, reflections. And uh, There are other episodes in the podcast that you might enjoy. If you enjoyed this one, I, the one of uh, Eric Swigendau, of course, on urban political ecology. We talked about donut economics, the one with Kate Raworth. So, you know, there is much more after that if you are interested. So once again, thank you, Federico. Thanks as well, everyone. And I'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Aristide.